in IT. Please give Johanna a warm welcome applause. So in addition to the ring, you get a certificate uh, made from goat leather, which is especially nice if you want to copy it, if you apply for a job, so just, just as an add-on. Uh, <laughs> but back to my, uh, my talk. Um, step back from the side note. Do we have a presenter, by the way? Yes. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Good. Does it work, is the second question. Green? Green? Oh, okay, it's so big. <laughs> Thank you. So, first technical problems uh, solved. Uh, now we will go somewhere less technical, because at the moment I don't see any sadder place in Austria than woods, and it's not because it's, out, uh, it's 10 o'clock, dark outside, and might be a bit scary. Austrian woods are even more scarier uh, by daylight because a lot of them are destroyed and look like this. Um, especially in the, in the north, so that's what we call uh, Waldviertel, around Badhofen and, and um, Raps and the Tire, more than 50% of, of the wood were harvested, so they are actually gone and the scenery has changed. And the reason that, therefore is this little friend. He's, it's really tiny, it's called the, the bark beetle or Borkenkäfer in German and lives under, under the, the inner bark of a tree, uh, uh, grows there, starts a family and so on and basically it attacks and kills spruces, so a special uh, type of trees that are quite common in our woods. If we um, change to this map. I mean, we are here in St. Pölten today, so um, the bigger parts of Lower Austria um, are hopefully known to everybody. And basically, every part of Lower Austria that has wood somewhere um, is affected more than average. Just the white spots, um, there are some, they typically have no wood. So, especially southern of Vienna, I'm from that area, we don't have a single tree in our village. So actually, there's also no 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 beetle. Um, <coughs> but coming back to to what's the, the the actual problem with the with the bark, it loves uh, spruce trees. Originally, it just affected the the weak ones, uh, which was not a problem. The problem is that climate change uh, causes hotter summers and warmer winters, even in Waldviertel now. And um, that makes them weak, and now it basically affects all uh, of the spruce trees. And Austrian woods are made, 68% of them, so basically all of our woods are affected. So, and I know that I'm right here, and I'm not at the forestry conference, this is ITSEC-X, and it's about security, but we have the same problem here in IT as well. And uh, if you don't believe me, I will give you some facts and figures so that at the end you will see that we have actually the pro same problem as outside in the woods. Um, and if you become a monoculture, you're, you're really at great risk of, of perishing. And George M. Church, he's a professor of genetics at Harvard University, so he's a big player in genetics, and I'm pretty sure he didn't think about uh, our woods back then, but he, it seems like he's true. But now, as I already said to IT, and back in 2014, which was already from an IT perspective, almost Stone Age or mummy tells from, granny tells from war. But in 2014, we had the heart bleed bug, so the older like me will remember, and I think I'm one of the, the older ones here. <laughs> there are a lot of students here. And, um, this, this bug uh, was a bug in the, in the Open SSL crypto library, just a short recapitulation who, who weren't in the security then, and part of the Heartbleed extension. And the problem was that it was basically a buffer overread, and you could access uh, information that you shouldn't 
uh, be allowed to access. So you could, for example, cross uh, secret keys from remote servers, and this is obviously not a good idea. This uh, sketch became uh, famous back then, so the idea was that you, you send a text, and again, in addition, a field with the length of the text, and it returned you the text, didn't check for the length, and sent you also the remainder that was stored in, um, in the memory. Good, back then, uh, there were researchers who measured how many of the top web services, so Alexa top million, were affected, and it were up to 55%, so roughly half of it. So by a single tiny bug, half of all, all web services were basically affected, and were vulnerable to quite a sophisticated, it was not the technically sophisticated attack, uh, attack, but the impact was quite harsh. The question is, did we learn from it? And the latest data that I found is from 2017. And the question is, how many of the same top web services uh, had been using this, uh, this protocol or this implementation of the TLS protocol in 2017? Just make up the number in your head. You can guess that it will be larger, otherwise I wouldn't present it here. <laughs> but if you have a number, you can compare it to what uh, other researchers measured back then, and it's 84%. So a bug like Heartbleed would be, have even more impact in 2017. And I'm not sure whether the number decreased or increased uh, since 2017, but my guess is it increased. <clears throat> and this is for, for a bug that was uh, considered by the Electric Frontier Foundation and Bruce Schneider one of the worst with regard to its impact since the commercialization of the internet. So it really had an impact. And while this was back in 2014, uh, sorry, and um, you could say, well, times are changing. Well, they are, but it's not becoming better. In 2016, we had the Mirai botnet, and it was something totally tif different technically. But uh, again, it were quite medium security issues that um, were exploited to form a botnet uh, consisting of digital video recorders, uh, smart cameras, and stuff alike. So basically, IoT devices, small IoT devices, and they were compromised by using standard passwords and standard users that you can find in tutorials, forums, uh, maybe also the manual. Uh, it appears like an adversary re reads the manual, and um, that were up to 600,000 uh, bots that then cost, following the creator of many, many pennies, also make a dollar, uh, the largest distributed denial of service attacks known at this time. Yeah. And what's interesting about this attack is that polluters pay doesn't, doesn't count in that case, because the one who were vulnerable didn't uh, um, didn't feel the consequences of the, of the eventual attack. It were other well-maintained uh, web services that were attacked afterwards. And in the same case, you can also um, attack the power grid. So you can not also bring web services down, but also the power grid, and it's dark again. But then we can at least go to the wood and we don't see the disaster there. Um, that was the Mira case. And just 2018-19, we saw Melton on Spectra. You see, this, this attack at least has some logos again, and my slides don't have to remain white. They exploit some processor vulnerabilities, and I don't want to go into the details, but in the end, you can, again, uh, gain information that is processed at the moment. And if you think about which devices are, um, are vulnerable and affected, basically all of them, it's quite hard to find uh, devices that are not affected by these, uh, by these attacks or by these vulnerabilities. I'm pretty sure we're, that we find in this room, so 1015, St. Burton, Friday night, we find 100 devices that are vulnerable to these uh, attacks in this room. So, and the problem here is that not only a lot of these devices are affected, but it takes quite a long 
until you changed all your mobiles and your laptops and your desktop PCs. So it might uh, uh, take multiple years till all the vulnerable devices are outdated and removed and not used anymore. So this brings us back to that sentence. If you become a monoculture, you're at great risk of perishing. And this is also true for our IT infrastructure and also the internet as a whole. So maybe it's not an overall good idea. But what's, what's the solution to it? I mean, on the one hand, we can look that we close every single vulnerability, but in the end, there will always be some kind of zero-day attack. And such an attack then affects, like the meltdown and spectra um, attacks, a kind of a lot of devices, and we have quite a huge aftermath. So what could be the solution? And this slide already gives a hint, but first we're going back into the woods and to our tiny little friends, the, the um, beetle. So let's recap what's the problem of this beetle. On the one hand, it loves spruce. Uh, the second thing is that it affected first only the, the weak ones, but now mainly all. And the problem that of sustainability in our woods is that 68% of our woods are spruce. So the, uh, the conclusion is in forestry uh, that they go towards more diverse forests for a mixed forests, so they basically uh, don't plant tr uh, spruces only but also other trees um, so that if they are affected not the whole wood um, is at risk but just some trees of it. And um, beyond, I think that mixed forests, I know they, they, they are harder to work on, at least this is was my, was what my granny tells all the, all the time, that it's really hard because you have different trees, but they are also more beautiful. The question is whether we can also um, adapt this solution for security and the technical fear, sphere. And I went into literature, and indeed there are some concepts of diversity in technology, generally. Uh, the most known is design diversity, which is more popular uh, uh, by the name of N-version programming. And as the, as the picture shows, um, you have multiple versions of the same software, or the software uh, performs the same goal. And the differences between version 1, 2 and 3 is basically that they were developed by different teams in a different environment, like for example using different libraries, using different uh, programming language and so on. And then all these three versions run in parallel and the output is compared. The ratio behind is that if one fails, it's quite likely that the others don't fail. And uh, that's the notion of independence of the different uh, software implementations. But as you can imagine, this is cost intensive because you actually program stuff three times. Um, and therefore, it's mainly used in mission critical systems like uh, airplanes and helicopters, uh, military stuff, um, and so on. Rockets, quite likely, as well. And um, and the next thing is, you don't want to uh, copy this system in, in for security, because on the other side, uh, on the one hand, I already said it's very cost intensive, you would have to um, implement everything three times. And the next thing is, you don't want to run three versions of TLS on your mo uh, mobile or your laptop when you're surfing on Amazon for your uh, friend's birthday party. This would be... Um, uh, cause, uh, take a lot of power, your laptop would qui become quite warm, your battery life uh, the, or the battery life of your, of your mobile becomes quite short. So this is actually not, nothing you can sell and this was really the problem of taking the concept as is to security. But if we think I just copied a few logos and where I didn't find one I just printed the name there. There are some alternatives to the open SL SS SSLs um, implementation. So OpenSSL was the one that was vulnerable to Heartbleed 
and there are some alternatives. Um, and the idea would, or and if you think about these alternatives, they basically fulfill the very notion of the versions that we have seen before, because actually they fulfill this, the same goal, like they implement TLS, they follow the same specification, which is in our case, for example, an RFC by the Internet Engineering Task Force, and they are usually also implemented uh, independently, not all of them and not 100%, uh, but basically they fulfill the goal or the, of independence. And if we manage that these different implementations are used more or less equally among the internet, a single uh, bug cannot cause that much aftermath because, for example, if we have five of them, roughly 20% per, um, per uh, implementation, a single attack that affects one implementation uh, affects 20% of the nodes, and that's it. So this is um, a picture that depicts um, the, the idea. So at the top, you have the, the standard. Of course, it depends that the standard at least is secure. That's another problem. Um, but one, one goal, uh, one target behind the other one. And you see that we have different implementations like OpenSSL, LibreSSL, and WolfSSL, and so on. And we look that they are quite equally spread. S the problem is, however, if you um, remember the slide that I presented quite at the beginning, we are not there. We are in a situation where more than 80% of, um, of the servers use uh, TLS and nothing else, so we are very far from diversity, and the, and the problem is how, how do we come there? Because technically, it, would be, it wouldn't be a problem. And this is where uh, my team starts to work, and we try to, to solve at least a part of this puzzle uh, at SPA. Uh, and in, basically, we have three open questions. The one is, which technologies are used on the internet if we, in the first step, try to, to gain a sustainable internet? Uh, the second question is, how is diversity on the internet determined? Uh, I sh have shown you numbers about open t uh, OpenSSL, but that are more or less the only numbers of technologies that I've found, more or less. And the third question is, how do strategies look like that lead us to this more diverse internet? And the first question is already quite tricky, because we all know that there are some technologies out there on the internet, and some we are just blind to them, uh, because we don't know what's out there, actually. I mean that um, there are some DLS implementation and it might be OpenSSL. That's a no-brainer. But for example, there are, uh, I'm pretty sure that there are software libraries outside that are included in more or less all solutions that are programmed in this specific language. Um, but I don't know that. Yeah? So, and if they would have, if they had a vulnerability, it, you have again the same effect. So, you basically run into the problem that you have a perception of a technology and an actual importance. And um, the giants are okay because you think they are important and your measurements say, well, they are important, that's okay. Um, if you have, if you uh, perceive a, a technology quite low, but its importance is also quite low, well, okay, that's fine. If you um, think that one is quite important, but it is not, well, you spend a lot of time on measuring and uh, uh, thinking, but in the end, you spend time, but nothing more happened. But the really problem are the illusionary drafts, because you don't know them, or you think they, they are not important at all. You don't start to measure them, you don't start to think about them, but in the end, uh, they are of high importance, and if they fail, then quite a lot of uh, fails, and you basically have a kind of virtual uh, single point of failure, and this is not a good idea. The second thing is, how do we determine diversity? Well, basically, this is then the more technical aspect that you have to measure. You can either actively measure, that is what, for example, the TLS uh, people me uh, measure, so they have fingerprints and scans. 
Um, you can passively measure. What we also tried and had success is that you uh, investigate artifacts that are produced. We did it for the blockchain. They do quite a lot of artifacts, so you can uh, calculate back. And the third thing is use statistics. Use every statistics you can find from sales to estimations, from Gartner and so on. But in the end, you get more or less a picture, a big picture, but I'm still, but I'm pretty sure that it's not a full picture, but the more you know, the better. But in the end, if we know which uh, technologies are such kind, uh, we have a single point of failures, then we can try to uh, um, make up strategies that lead to a more diverse internet. And this is um, also a challenge because it's mostly about humans. Because there are operators, for example, administrators, who decide which implementation they use. And most likely they have a reason. It might not be an um, obvious reason or an explicit reason, but they might use OpenSSL because they know it, they learned it at uh, university, they, they found uh, a tutorial, um, and it comes together with some other software they are using. So these are strategies you first have to know before you can change them to eventually lead to this diverse internet where you have one third of the administrators deciding for this solution and the other one deciding for this solution. But again, at this point you have to uh, understand why they choose this solution over the other. Well, and in the end, I, hopefully we have a diverse internet and I hope I, uh, in the room there's nobody who, who thought about um, a diversity call a diversity to uh, talk like from human resources or from forestry. It's uh, about a T and also their di diversity is a solution towards a more sustainable and reliable system. It won't be the solution for everything, but it uh, kind of increases that systems are working and a single vulnerability doesn't affect all of it. Um, so it's a long way to go. But I, th I think we can make it and uh, at least one step further to gain this overview and to see which technologies are this kind of uh, virtual signal point of failures. And if you have questions, I'm open to answer them now or offline. I don't know how much time. Yeah, it's a bit. We have a bit. And uh, I'm very welcome to questions and also to hints which technologies you might think about uh, and also about the last things about the human factor. Thank you.